Hi, this is Dr. Vicente, and welcome to the introductory lecture for EDUC 7101, Managing the Challenges of Educational Change, an introduction. We begin by looking at this quotation from Alvin Toffler, the author of the acclaimed book, Future Shock. One of the quotations that he uses, which I think is really relevant for the purpose of our course, is the following. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. This is a challenge that I argue we will be encountering and dealing with as we look at the issue of educational transformation, educational change, educational reforms, and how different stakeholders manage it. It's really the part of unlearning and relearning which is really important for us to think about as we look at managing educational change. Let me briefly talk about the design principles of our course. First, we are going to be using the flipped classroom approach. This actually applies more to our on-campus students, but for those who are doing this course externally, the entire program is really built on a flipped classroom model. In other words, what happens is that you will be provided with resources for you to be able to read and engage with on your own, and then in the occasions that you have interactions with me, the lecturer, what happens is that um, we undertake activities. In EDUC 7101, I will actually be providing opportunities for external students like yourselves who are listening to this particular video to join us in some of the sessions that we have on campus. Of course, um, that should be with the proviso that it allows you to join us, time permitting. So the flipped classroom model. The second design principle is that we will be building most of our, in fact, all of our assessment tasks on communities of practice. And I'll explain this a little further, uh, a little, uh, in greater detail, a little further during this particular webinar. The third design principle is this notion of reflective practitioners. And I'm borrowing the concept from Donald Sean. Really, my goal is that all of the students who are undertaking EDUC 7101 become reflective practitioners, become lifelong learners. The definition of a reflective practitioner is someone who continues to learn. Hopefully, after you have completed this course, you would still be enthusiastic about learning, particularly issues and challenges related to managing educational change. And the fourth design principle is this notion that I, your lecturer and course coordinator, am your critical friend. I'm here to help you succeed. That image that you see there is myself, of course, and um, the more senior gentleman is uh, Professor Christopher Day one of the acclaimed um, giants of educational leadership worldwide. I consider him a critical friend. So the relationship that you have with a critical friend is that a critical friend is there to make you and help you succeed. Let's talk more about your critical friend in this course. That's me. So as I said, a critical friend is someone that ideally you can trust, I'll be asking provocative questions, I'll provide data to be examined through another lens. A critical friend offers critiques of a person's work as a friend and is an advocate for the success of that work. Again, I'm borrowing this notion of critical friend from Costa and Calic in their short article entitled Through the Lens of a Critical Friend. I personally attempt to be a critical reflective practitioner. And this is defined by an engagement typified by an extended critique of policy and reflections on practice dealing with education. So in the images that you see here, many years ago I was a teacher in Spain. And 
part of the tasks that I did there in Europe was not only to teach English, but also to go around the different cities of Spain, including France and Italy, to take a look at how educational institutions flourished. And, well, I looked at more than 50 educational institutions. And one of the insights, I actually gathered a lot of insights, but one of the insights that stuck with me is this phrase that you see here, sequema, in Spanish. Uh, or in English, it means to burn oneself, so teacher burnout. That's a phenomenon that I am very aware of. And that's also one of the areas that I make sure our teachers, pre-service, in-service, school leaders, do not fall into. My working hypothesis is that if you fall into burnout, there's actually no escape from it. And I usually advise individuals who find themselves in burnout to, to leave the profession. I know it sounds radical, but it's, it's, I think that's the best approach. Of course, I may be, a lot of people will disagree with me because they say that it can still be people who are in burnt out conditions can still be rescued. I argue that those who can still be rescued are not really completely burnt out. When I say burnt out, I really mean those who are really tired and who are disenchanted with the work that they do. I used to be a school principal in my home country, which is the Philippines, and one of the experiences that I had there was this frustration working with the national government because of the shift in education policy that happened almost overnight. When I became a principal in my first year, we had a policy change in which all the subjects in, in primary and secondary school had to be taught in the mother tongue. So the year that I became principal, I invested a lot in recruiting teachers who could teach in the mother tongue. I invested so much in buying textbooks and professional development courses for my teachers in order for them to be able to teach in the mother tongue. And then a year after, what happened was that the Secretary of Education in the Philippines ran for political office and the person who replaced him decided to switch back to teaching all the subjects in English. So overnight, all the investments that I made in relation to educational change just vanished. That frustration pushed me to looking at pushed me into looking at different ways of looking at how we can influence educational policy. And one of the things that I found really very powerful is this notion of networks, uh, networks of reform. So that's something that I am continually studying and exploring. The third one that I do is this notion of corruption and its impact on human services. I take a look at corruption and particularly how it becomes a moderating variable in the successful implementation of education reform particularly or primarily in developing country contexts, but also in developed country settings. I also see myself as a critical ethnographer. Um, my two recent books, the one in 2009, talks about corruption and implementation, and the one of two years ago looks at mapping the terrain of education reform. So the kind of research that I do, I, I hope to change or contribute to changing some aspects of society, I challenge the status quo and ask why is it so, and I engage in a critical, literal dialogue with participants. What's going to happen to our course? Our course is going to be divided into three big themes. The first theme, or theme one, looks at what is change. And for each of the weeks, I've assigned you readings which revolve around one particular aspect of change. First one is a, essentially a welcome, and I've given you two readings that are not too difficult to, to digest and to understand. And then the complexity of the readings increases as we go through the weeks of the semester. So week two looks at reflections. Week three introduces this notion of structure and agency. And then week four looks at issues and challenges. In theme one, the question that I would really like you to think about is the following that you see in the slide. How do you see yourself 
in periods of change. I'm actually asking you to think about your identity as an individual in the midst of educational change, in the midst of education transformations and educational reform. How do you see yourself? The second big theme of our course is the question, how do we analyze change? And in this second theme, we have four weeks. Week five looks at policy, process, and practice. Week six looks at contexts of educational reforms. Week seven is an interrogation of education reform. And week eight delves into this notion of wicked problems. The question that I really want you to look at, apart from how you analyze change in theme two, is a more personal question directed at you. And that question is the following. Can you lead change? This question really looks at your sense of agency. As you find yourself in periods of change, do you feel that you're empowered? Do you feel that you can contribute to the change? Or do you feel that you're disempowered? That there's really nothing that you can do. That you seem to be dragged along or, or swept by the currents of change. So I'd like you to reflect on that as you go through the readings of theme two. Can you lead change? If you notice, uh, some of the weeks are highlighted in different colors. So week five is highlighted in green. Week 5 is actually the due date for your Assignment 1. Your Assignment 1 is going to be a community of practice activity. You will be self-assigning yourself into groups next week. And, I mean, that will happen in Week 3. And then, in your self-assignment, you will be encouraged to write an outline, 500 words or roughly a minute and a half video. And that outline is about your Assignment 2. Right? And you're going to be sharing your outlines with your small community of practice and you, you will obtain feedback from them. I will also be reading your outlines and provide you with feedback. Essentially, we're scaffolding your work so that you essentially succeed. Ideally, the kind of feedback that you get on week 5 for your assignment 1 is critical enough from your community of practice so that they can help you submit a more robust, and stronger, and more convincing work two weeks later. That's on week seven. Of course, on week seven, the one highlighted in yellow, that's the due date for your assignment two. That is the essay that looks at uh, critical literature review of uh, educational change. We move on to the third and final theme of our course. The third theme is longer. We're looking at weeks 9 all the way to week 14. In other words, 6 weeks. Theme 3 looks at the question, what are the relationships between leadership, stakeholders, and change? And on week 9, we look at comparative perspectives. On week 10, we look at leadership and education reform. Week 11 is about school-based management and education reform. Week 12 looks at education reform and its outcomes. Week 13 is education reform and its stakeholders, part one. And the final week is education reform and its stakeholders, part two. Similar to theme two, you notice or you will notice that on week 12, this is highlighted in green. This is the due date for your assignment three. Once again, you're going to be undertaking this through communities of practice, self-selected communities that you are part of. You will submit a 500-word outline or a one-and-a-half-minute video, audio, presentation about your assignment four. And as you have done in the previous assignments, you would have done in the previous assignments, ideally, you will be able to get constructive, critical feedback from the members of your community of practice. I'll also be giving you critical and constructive feedback to enable you to submit a more robust, and more compelling final assignment, which is due on week 14. Now, for theme three, the real question that I want you to reflect on as an individual, as a learner in this course is, who and what are the important components of change? I'd like you to reflect 
as you see yourself in the midst of educational change and determine what you think are the most important components, who are the most important components. What I'm trying to find out here is your sense of autonomy, your sense of being able to choose what you think you should focus on as most important and who you should work with as, again, the important components of change. So these are the three themes that are covered for EDUC 7101. This particular slide is what I use for the on-campus course. It's basically just a reflection on who you are. Uh, you may want to engage in this. Uh, if uh, you choose number one, introduce yourself, briefly describe a particular change that you're grappling with in your work context, what do you do? If you choose number two, uh, look at the quotation from Horace Mann and share what you think about the statement. If you choose number three, I've provided a graphic Seven out of a hundred top universities in the world come from Australia. Introduce yourself, share with us what you think about the fact presented before you. Finally, this newspaper front page talks about the headline quarter of or a quarter of high school students dropping out. This is in Australia in October 2015. So introduce yourself, share with us what you think about the issue presented before you. You could actually use this particular slide as a way to introduce yourself to your respective communities of practice. This is just an idea. It's not a requirement, but I'm suggesting that that's one way for you to get to know each other. Earlier, I talked about communities of practice. So communities of practice is actually a notion that was popularized by Etienne Wenger. This is him right here with a brown sweater. And if you notice, it's, that's me right beside him. Um, I am a big um, fan of the work of Etienne Wenger, particularly communities of practice. I think theoretically it is rich, and practically I have used it. I have modified it, but I think it's really very useful. A brief discussion of what communities of practice are, I think, is important. First, it consists of what is referred to as mutual engagement. Participation through the community, members establish norms and build collaborative relationships. This is what is meant by mutual engagement. These relationships are the ties that bind you and your members in the community of practice. The second characteristic of what Wenger describes as a community of practice is joint enterprise. Through the interactions that you make within your communities of practice, Everyone creates a shared understanding of what binds all of you together. And this joint enterprise is renegotiated by the members and is sometimes referred to as the domain of the community. Right? When you work on your assignments, so the domain of your COP for the first assignment will be well, a critical literature review, and then the domain for the second assignment for your community of practice will be about case studies of educational change. The third characteristic of what Wenger calls a community of practice is shared repertoire. This is really a fundamental component of the practice that happens within the COPs. The community produces a set of communal resources, which is termed the shared repertoire. And these are used by the members in the pursuit of joint enterprise, and this really involves both really literal as well as symbolic meanings. The figure you see here, this jigsaw puzzle, a triangular jigsaw puzzle with domain, community, practice, and COP is a graphic that Etienne Wenger um, agrees to and it really typifies what a community of practice is, what a COP is. For this introductory lecture, I'm actually going to invite you to work with me in this simple exercise. The question I'd like you to look at is the one that is on the slide. What is most important to the happiness of young adolescents? And I'm actually referring to Aristotle's notion of what happiness is, the highest good. He assumes that the highest good, whatever it turns out to be, has three characteristics, desirable for itself, not desirable for the sake of some other good, 
and all other goods are desirable for its sake. I have this slide that you can see. You could also use the Padlet, and it has um, a, a similar uh, set of materials that you can find. And I'd like you to think about life goals and aspirations of a typical adolescent. Usually what I would do is I would ask you to rank these, but what I'm going to ask you to do is to identify what you believe would be what a typical adolescent would rank as a top five life goals and aspirations. Right? So there are 25 of them, being known as a popular student, being known as a smart student, that's number two, how good looking people think I am, all the way to number 25. And what I'd like you to think about is rate or rank or identify what you think a typical adolescent would enumerate as a top five. You can pause this particular presentation at this moment and make a listing of your um, of your of the five which you think adolescents would identify. Ideally, you would have already completed the listing. And now what I'd like you to do is to compare your list with what I have discovered in the research that I do. As you can see, um, this is really part of a longitudinal study that I did, um, which basically tracked individuals, the same set of individuals. This was a panel longitudinal study. I tracked the same set of individuals from year 7, year 8, and then year 9. As you can see, in year one, they chose to be filial as the most important, to respect myself as a second one, to be a loyal citizen, third, to be loyal to the company I will work for, fourth, and to have a sense of meaning and purpose in life. A year after, in this panel longitudinal study, the ranks have changed. To respect myself as number one, to have a sense of meaning and purpose in life as number two, to have a sense of achievement as number three. But it's still pretty much the same. The ones in the top 10 remain in the top five or so a year after the conduct of the survey. If you can see here, the ones that have registered the lowest are whether people think I'm cool, whether my parents have a car, how good looking people think I am. Usually what happens here is that when I ask teachers or people in schools or adults to undertake this survey, they make the mistake of identifying people think I'm cool, whether my parents have a car, or maybe how good-looking people think I am, being known as a popular student. This is usually included in the top five or top ten. This is a mistake, this is an error that a lot of adults and I, and I say teachers make. I wonder if you made that same sort of assumption. As you see, this is a continuation of that slide where it is really whether people think I'm cool registers the lowest in year one, year two, and even year three of this longitudinal study. We rearrange the data, and when we re rearrange the data, this is what we see. Um, the students who participated in the survey, we describe them as a mix of Students who have traditional beliefs, supporting your parents, getting married and having children, working in a job that really interests you. These are what we refer to as traditional beliefs. And 32.7% of the participants, we actually, uh, incidentally, we had about 30,000 participants to this project that we undertook. And then 56.9% of the participants are individuals or young people who embrace modernist beliefs, being able to choose the kind of life you want to live, having a strong sense of achievement in your life, to be treated fairly by others. When we say modernist, it's really more individual-oriented, what an individual wants. And the last set of beliefs are what we refer to as postmodern. Apologies for this. I'm trying to adjust the screen. Postmodern beliefs are those that refer to image more than anything else, to work in a job that provides me with security, getting along with other people, becoming popular, being more successful than peers. Right? So these are what we 
these are the insights that we are able to obtain after we rearrange and analyze the data more carefully. So that's the first exercise that I wanted you to do. This time around, I'm providing you another survey questionnaire. I'd like you to identify what you think would be the value of education, of what young adolescents think about or believe in. So here I'd like you to focus. Would you like to focus on primary school kids or secondary school kids? So think about a typical primary school kid or a typical secondary school kid. And think about what they would identify as a value of education. Is it about learning about yourself, learning about nature, spending time with friends, all the way down to learning new things. And usually I'm going to ask you to rank. But for this first lecture that we're doing, I'm going to ask you to identify what you think are the top three. Identify the top three things that a typical primary school kid or a secondary school kid, or even a post-secondary school kid, right? those in, um, um, in the early years of university would think about. Because we did the survey for primary school kids, secondary school kids, as well as post-secondary school kids. At this point of this presentation, I would invite you to pause for a while and start identifying what you think would be the top three that a typical young person would choose. Ideally, you would have already identified your top three. Let's compare it with what actually came out of our research. As you can see, uh, we started with primary four kids who became primary five, secondary one kids who became secondary two, and what we see here is that for primary four kids, the most important value of education is doing well in exams. When they became primary five, the same set of students, it was getting a high paying job that became more important. Secondary one, it's been consistent, getting a high paying job and getting a high paying job in the second year is really what is most important. Now, to contextualize this survey, was done in Singapore. It was started sometime in 2009 and then continued to 2010, 2010, 2011, and 2012. So it's been some years. During that time, the preoccupation of Singapore was this notion of um, emigres. They had the phenomenon of emigration, not immigration, but emigration. They were discovering that Singaporeans were leaving the country. As part of this survey, I, trained as a political scientist, I looked at notions of civic capital, sense of belonging, sense of being um, a member of one's nation. And if you see here, in this particular, the results of this survey, what we, are dis what we discovered several years ago is that in Singapore, the message that young people get as early as primary school and in the early years of secondary school is that education is really for you to be able to get a high paying job. So the assumption or the conclusion we were making was that if at a young age, we, 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 this is the message that we're giving to young kids, when they grow older and they're offered uh, an opportunity to work elsewhere, we were thinking that they will not have second thoughts leaving the country. If you juxtapose or if you posit this survey, what is most important or what is the value of education, and then reflect on the previous survey, which is about what are the life aspirations or what makes young people happy, you might detect some incongruence. So let me explain it. In the Singaporean context, what our project reveals, this is a $30 million project, by the way, a massive project that was undertaken. What our survey has informed us, what the survey has revealed us, is that um, young people in Singapore, for them, what is really an aspiration for their life, what will make them happy, is if they embrace traditional values as well as modernist values. And when we ask them about education, 
it can be clearly seen that education does not make them happy. Education is not something that contributes to their happiness. In fact, they see it merely from a very economic standpoint. It's not something that lets them spend time with friends, that lets them learn new things. It's really more an instrument to be able to succeed in the future. This is the message that, uh, that we were able to pick up in a Singapore context. It's fascinating to see that education is viewed in that light. I'm sure that in other contexts, it's also seen in very similar lights. But to see it very strongly as early as primary school kids and to see how economics trumps the other virtues or the other aspirations that we have in education is really very, very interesting to ponder. Let's take a look at this notion of new economic competencies. The new economy competencies talk about interpersonal skills, inventive thinking, work-related skills, knowledge management skills, and self-regulation. And under each of these big skills, you have several other more detailed descriptions of what these skills are. For this third exercise in this introductory lecture, i like it to identify what, your, what you think are the most popular or what students or what young people would identify would be the essential new economy competencies that they need. And I've listed down here time management, social leadership skills, all the way to teamwork. And what I would usually do if we had time was for you to for me to ask you to rank them. But for purposes of this introductory lecture, what I'm going to ask you to do is to just identify what you think will be the top three new economy competencies that um, that young people uh, learn or aspire to learn in their classrooms. Again, I'm going to pause at this moment so that you could see whether these new economy competencies skills are actually taught or learned in your context in the classrooms that you are exposed to. Let us assume that you've already undertaken the identification of the top three new economy competencies. Now let's take a look at what we generated from our survey. For primary five kids, lifelong learning is the one that uh, they experience happening in their classrooms. And they say that orientation to competition is the one that is least experienced. Take a look at secondary. These, what they see is that teamwork is the one that is practiced a lot. And the one that is not practiced or the least practiced is decision making. Now, why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because there's something that is really interesting that is happening in Singapore. In our project, we actually, the 30,000 students who were part of the representative sample, we chose a representative sample of all the schools in Singapore. Therefore, the results of our survey were pretty confident reflects the entire population of young people. We correlated conventional measures. The conventional measures are results in English and math. So what we did was we asked the 30,000 to take um, custom-made tests in English and math that were created for us by the University of New South Wales. We correlated these with um, the new economic competencies. How do you read a correlation table? You read a correlation table this way. What is the correlation between UNSW English scores, right, this one, and group engagement as a new economic competency skill? It's 12 and it's statistically significant, 0 0.12. What is the correlation between risk-taking and UNSW math, the, the conventional outcome of UNSW math? We see here that it's 0 0.08 and that it's statistically significant at, at 0 0.01. Now, in re when we read correlation tables, we actually are trying to look for correlation coefficients. These figures are called correlation coefficients. We look for correlation coefficients that are higher than 0 0.30. When we see that they're higher than 0 
what that tells us is that something is going on between the elements on this side and the elements on this side. Right? Now, if you take a look at this particular table, do you see any correlation coefficient that is higher than 0 0.30? You should have guessed, or you should have made the observation that social and leadership skill and UNSW English have a correlation of 0.22. That's almost 30%, but still below 30%. So when you look at this, any statistician will say that, well, really there is nothing happening between the conventional measure of English and social leadership skills. Even if it's close to 30, even if it's 0.22, it's still below 0.30. Actually, when you take a look at all these correlation coefficients, you can say, or you can argue that there doesn't seem to be any correlation between new economic competencies and conventional measures. If we take a look at the work-related skills, self-regulation, and knowledge management skills, continuing our discussion of correlations between new economic competencies on this side and traditional conventional measures, tell me if you see any correlation coefficient that's close to 0 0.20. Again, you should have observed that it's going to be this one, interdisciplinary skills, 0.21, statistically significant, and UNSW English. But then again, it's below 0 0.30. So you might say, and you can say, that there's really nothing going on between new economic competencies and conventional measures. Now, the insight that you can get here is something that is really very interesting. What our team argue is that the high-stakes testing regime in Singapore does not contribute to its goal of preparing its young people for the 21st century economy. Why? In the 21st century economy, if we follow the argument, what is necessary or what is referred to as new economy competencies to be, be able to work, um, to be able to self-regulate, to be able to have knowledge management skills. And what we're saying is that conventional measures, of performing well in English and math, for example, these are not needed in 21st century economies. And the students who took this survey say that the preoccupation of Singapore's education system on conventional measures does not in any way contribute to building new economic competencies. These were very challenging figures that we presented to the Ministry of Education in Singapore. This graphic shows you the evolution of the, their education landscape. The reason why I choose Singapore as a discussion, I'm going to be also highlighting other countries. The reason I choose Singapore is that it's a, it's a virtual laboratory. It's a really nice way to take a look at education transformation. The government has been around for more than 50 years, literally its entire young history. So it has enjoyed policy continuity. Unlike in other places, like in Australia, for example, the, the pendulum swings from the labor to the liberal government coalition, to the nationals, and to, again to labor, what we see is that education policy sometimes is discontinued. And it's very difficult for us to be able to analyze how long-lasting education changes because of, the, because of the, again, the almost fickle nature of politics that has an impact, that have an impact on education. Whereas in Singapore, the fascinating thing about it is that it's been one government for the last 50 years. So when you take a look at the impact of education policy, this is one of the best places to study it. The question that Singapore has is, will it be able to, to actually embrace change? Ever since its early inception, it has embraced high-stakes testing as a form of meritocracy. Its national leaders are determined by high-stakes testing. The smart ones are the leaders of the nation. The argument that we made in our study was that, if you take a look at this figure again, the arguments that we made in our study is that if we are going to really look at 21st century, you don't need to be smart, which is recorded or measured by, state, by tests, by high-stakes tests. 
but will the nation, Singaporean nation, be willing to change their meritocratic system that is grounded on the Mandarin system, which is patterned after the Mandarin, the, the, the tests that scholars take in China in order to determine who the elites would be. Would they be willing to change that in order to prepare themselves for the 21st century economy? So one of the arguments that I continually make is that Singapore that prides itself as being a, a dynamically changing nation, I argue that this change is really not deep change, but it's really incremental change. Now we're going to look at this in greater detail in the succeeding lectures that we have. The readings that we assigned for the first week, that I assigned for the first week or two, Reforming Again, Again and Again by Larry Cuban, and also Education Reform, Making Sense of It All. I hope that you've had a chance to read them, and I hope that you reflect on the questions that I've highlighted here. How do the authors define change? In your interpretation, what are the barriers and what are the enablers of change? In your interpretation, what is the impact of educational change? This last slide is really an invitation for you to reflect. As you reflect on this particular lecture that I have given you, what surprises did you encounter today? Were there any surprises? Did the survey results turn out to be a surprise for you, for example? Reflect on action. What are your own hunches that seem to resonate with discoveries, surprises encountered today? Were there some things that resonated with your hunches, with your gut feel, with your tacit knowledge? Reflective practice. What would you like to explore and investigate further as you reflect about change? This third question really is more about you thinking about your first assignment, your second assignment, your third and your final assignment. What would you explore, what would you like to investigate and explore further? Again, I am a, your critical friend. And I was really hoping that the exercises that I gave you provided you with a bit of surprise. As you remember, my role is to provoke you into thinking about your set knowledge, pushing you to a, a place which is really away from your comfort zone, and the purpose of which is for you to learn. Because I would like to tell you that I am an advocate for your success. Feel free to communicate with me, email me if you have any questions, comments, suggestions in relation to this first lecture. Thank you.